This is the Note Closer Show, where you get the latest developments in distressed note investing and learn the secrets of how you can control millions of dollars worth of property for pennies on the dollar. Get educated and entertained by someone who has closed thousands of deals and lives to support you in achieving the same. Now, here's your host, CEO of We Close Notes, Scott Carson. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Hope you're doing well this, uh, what is today? Today's Thursday. Things are rocking and rolling along in the office here. Uh, as always, we've always got exciting things that we're working on uh, to pass the time and stuff. Uh, gotta, have to give a big shout out to people that are out there uh, marketing and making some things happen. Um, also have to give a little bit of a kickback uh, in a quick little moment of silence, I guess, for one of the the people that stood out the most out there as far as being their own person would be the, the passing of uh, Hugh Hefter at 91, which is kind of sad guy was a, uh, whether you, whether you, what do you think of Playboy or not? The guy was definitely a innovator and a um, successful entrepreneur who really went against the grain and was not afraid to, to march to his own drum and live his own dreams. And one of uh, his quotes, I think is very, very popular out there is one of my favorite ones and, and that's a, a, a pretty simple one. Maybe some of you guys have heard me pull it up here real fast. It is, oh, hang on, where is it here? Um, life is too short to be living somebody else's dreams. And I think that's a, a great, great quote to keep in mind that we all have to be working towards what we want to accomplish ultimately. And we're lucky enough to live in the United States for those that listen here domestically or are watching domestically because we do have 5% of our listeners are international listeners. I noticed on the stats yesterday. So uh, we have people in over um, 20 countries listening to the podcast. So if you're an international listener, thank you. Would love to uh, know about you. Leave a review on Stitcher or iTunes. But we all chase our dreams, and we still live in a a society where we can accomplish our dreams. So go out and make something happen, and we'll go from there. So, But today's topic um, is all about, I think, one of the most – misconceived areas of note investing and that's uh, that's buying notes that have a ton of equity behind the unpaid balance and i'm, I'm talking first liens here we'll talk a little bit about second liens in a minute um but it, it i see a lot of note investors who struggle when they see notes with equity deals and for those that are watching yes i'm wearing my twins jersey go twins they clinched the playoff spot last night for the first time in the history of baseball where a hundred Lost team went to the playoffs the next year. Go Twins. But anyway, a lot of note investors, when they're looking at tapes, they'll see an asset that uh, the balances say 45000 The unpaid balance is forty five, And let's say the value is ninety, And there's a substantial amount of equity there. I mean, value is ninety. The house is worth forty five, And people get all excited about that. The thing you have to keep in mind is most note sellers, banks, hedge funds, when they see stuff like that, they're not going to sell. Uh, they're not going to sell that note at a substantial discount. They're not going to sell it at 50 cents on the dollar unpaid balance. There's no reason for them to, because if they foreclose, what happens to the note? What happens at the foreclosure auction? Well, there's a lot of equity there, and in most foreclosure auctions, assets are getting bid up 80, 90 cents on the dollar of true market value, and so that would be great if you're the property owner of the asset. Okay, and you sold the asset for 80, 90 grand, you pay off your underlying mortgage of 45, and you're, you're seeing 35 grand in profits. But that's not the case. As a note investor, as a true note investor, first lien, the most you could bid at the auction would be your payoff amount. That's your unpaid balance plus re, uh, back payments plus late fees. That's your, that's your highest bid price. Let's say it's 50 or 55, and it bids up at 80, you're not going to get that $35,000 difference. You're going to get the 55, the 35 grand then is going to go back to the borrower. Or if it's a deceased borrower, back to the borrower's estate. You're not going to be able to claim that overage at the tax, I'm not sorry, at the foreclosure auction. Okay? doesn't work that way. And I see so many people get excited. Oh, there's equity and equity because they come from the, the real estate side of things. Love now, as a previous 
postcard mailer, yellow letter, door knocker, real estate investor. One of the things that I would used to do is I would target properties with equity. I'd find you know properties I could take over subject to because maybe they uh, it was, was worth 120 and they only owed 100. Yeah, if I took over subject two, then I had that equity. If I sold the property at that point, then I would capitalize on it nineteen or twenty thousand dollars in equity that would go in my pocket, being technically the property owner. It doesn't work that way, notes. First liens, you're not going to see that equity. Now, what is a little bit different? Second lien investors will go after equity deals, especially on their seconds, because they're buying the second as a substantial fraction. Okay, and they're they're going to get made whole with that. That so they'll chase those with equity because if there is a second on those compared to what the first balance is toward the full market value, if there is a second, they'll often get paid in full uh, at the foreclosure auction. And they, since they're in a second lien position behind a non-performing first, they're still going to buy it at a discount. But those are also getting bid up as well as demand is going down and values have accelerated. So whereas seconds weren't always fully, you know, fully paid off. Now the values of these assets have been around for a while are exceeding the first and the second balances. So that equity beyond the second balance would then go to the homeowner. All right. Or the seconds are hoping to foreclose subject to the first. All right. To do the eviction. All right. And then take that equity back. All right. So now the only time that a first lien note deal makes sense to buy with equity is if you can get the bar to do a deed low. All right. You get the bar to do a cash for keys. But you have to think of the, the, the mentality of a homeowner. If they think there's a lot of equity there, they're going to fight you. All right? Say the house is worth 150 and they only owe 100. There's equity there that either they have paid for by paying down their mortgage or they have ridden the valuation wave up as the property values increased. So they think they're entitled to something. They're going to fight you for that. Those have always been the, the deals that have drug out the longest is when there's equity. Now, that's not saying you can offer a substantial cash for keys. You could, but you have to realize, too, <laughs> some people know what their property is worth. All they've got to do is have somebody talk to, and then they will drag stuff out. And then you're often paying too much for the first lien, all right? Most of the banks that are selling first liens that are turned of equity, they're going to sell it at 90, 95 cents of unpaid balance because their justification is you're going to get paid off at the foreclosure auction. Now, what's also disturbing, which aggravates the crap out of me, is some sellers will sell off a payoff, not UPB. Oh, they, you know, their total legal balance is 110. For I me, mean, first paid balance, first lien is, you know, it's 80. You got 30,000 in back payments. Well, you know what? Don't sell it to me off of the, the payoff. It's still, my purchase price still needs to be off of UPB. All right. Yes, if there's equity at that point, say it's worth 150 and there's like 20 grand equity, that's not a lot of equity because you can figure out one comp. You know, a lot of times you get comps that fluctuate a little bit between five and 10 grand or sometimes 15 grand depending on the market and depending on the condition it's in. As we all know, homeowners like to think the value of the property is based off pristine condition, right, everybody? Not as is. Oh, that one sold for 150. That's brand new. Well, my piece of crap. <laughs> That's got the shag carpet from the 70s, the pink toilet still, green walls. the green walls, the flowered wall wallpapering, wood, yeah. panel. wood paneling. That's hot, baby. <laughs> you just paint over that. That's still hot. Very hot. My mom decided that instead of replacing a paneling, she was going to paint over it. Oh, so she painted over it white. And, of course, there's couches against the wall. So then she goes to move the furniture around, and there's a line on the walls where the back of the couches rub the paint off. Ah, oh, mom, killing me smalls, killing me smalls. But anyway, um, and I'm sure we're going to have some questions from people asking about this and specific deals. The reason I bring this up, I encourage people to email me deals that they're working through. And I have to give a big shout out to Todd. Uh, Todd Lavier sent a deal this morning to me. He's like, oh, it's in a desirable area where a lot of fix and flippers. Value, supposedly the BPO value is 90, the unpaid balance is 45. And I'm like, yeah, don't do that deal. Uh, because there's too much equity there. Your payoff is probably going to be around 52 total. That's the most you can bid. So the seller's going to want closer to the 45. They're not going to tell you. They're not going to sell that asset to you at 50 cents of unpaid balance on that aspect because of all the equity. So it, it, a lot of investors, they end up buying stuff thinking 
like the property owner, a traditional fix and flipper, or traditional real estate investor, where they tell you, oh, go after equity deals. Equity deals are good. You know, take down a subject two deals with a lot of equity, or you know, buy that at the foreclosure because there's a ton of equity on the ARV. That's not the case with note investing. All right. You're buying the balance of the loan. You only have the legal right to foreclose on the amount owed. Okay. You can't get shady. Now, don't get me wrong. Yes, you can negotiate, like I said, cash for keys, deed balloon. In some cases, the borrower is not going to know exactly what they have as far as values, but you have to be careful. You end up foreclosing. Um, there's been some equity stripping laws that gone in place. They've gotten some nasty in the last few years. Uh, I think California enacted a, a law a few years ago that he bought a note and then foreclosed and sold it for uh, for more than 85% of value to give a, a percentage of that back to the borrowers, especially on owner occupants. That's not fun. You're going to do all the work and still have to give money back after the deal? No. So got to be careful when it comes to that aspect of the first thing. That's the first thing you should look for. Hey, what's the UPB versus value? Now, the one thing that is different Okay, uh, you have non-performing notes where you've got to foreclose. The one thing that is different in a couple situations is contract for deeds, okay? Now, in contract for deeds, it's a more of an eviction process. If they don't pay, they don't stay, you evict. What you have to be careful of is there are a few states, like Michigan, I think Ohio is also one of those as well, that if the borrower, okay, on the contract for deed, has been paying for more than four years or has more than 25% equity in the deal, you then have to foreclose. Which I think those are actually, it's fair laws for the consumer uh, for the most part. I mean, I don't like the fact that it's because they ain't paid, but I do believe that the equity side is, is a fair thing. I mean, me, me being an investor, I'd like it if it wasn't, obviously, but for the most part, you have to keep that in mind that when you're looking at deals, hey, if they've been there for four years where they have more than 25%, in equity between what's owed and the true value of the property, then you've got to foreclose. So that's a little thing to keep in mind. Now, a contract for deeds, you shouldn't be paying near UPB either way. I mean, especially non-performing stuff, I would not be going really over 50%. I think it's better to be below that. I mean, if I'm paying 50%, it's gonna be close to the borrower's paid at least something in the last 12 months, which is what we'd like to target. I like to target contract for deeds that the borrower's made something of a payment in the last six to 12 months because that really shows a lot of interest in staying in the property. So I would rather keep them in the property uh, than I would have to you know, evict and then try to sell as an REO for the most part. So are any questions or comments from anybody? Okay, wow. People are just listening in on this Thursday. Now, hopefully it's nice and sunny other places. It's kind of dreary here the last couple of days. It's a little dreary here. It almost feels like June gloom in San Diego. It's a, okay, so June gloom, it's September sorrow. <laughs> I just made that up. That's not bad. We're in the September, September sorrow phase, but we are uh, excited, guys. We are basically uh, right about two weeks out from uh, Note Camp uh, 4.0. I'll be working on the schedule this weekend. Uh, also, don't forget that Quest IRA is having a huge event in Houston, the uh, IRA Boot Camp. Um, we'll be speaking there for a little time this Saturday from 9 to 6 at the um, – Oh, which is the conference center? I can't remember what the conference center is. It's the uh, it's one conference center there. It's going on there, <laughs> right off of West Chase, Westfield area of uh, Houston, if I remember correctly. Anyway, Nicole's over there hurriedly trying the uh, uh, to find out where it is. The anyway, but there's a big. It was a great event. About 200 plus investors are going to be there. IRA investors, so a good opportunity to come on out and uh, network with a bunch of people. It's at the. Um, I'm it should be right there. You're right there. It's, um, Click on the thing on the right hand side over there, Nicole. The image there. It doesn't say. It doesn't say. Hold on. There we go. It is the Norris Conference. Norris Conference. I wanted to say North, but it's not like the Norris, Norris Conference, Conference Center in Houston, Texas. So something to check out there, guys. Well worth the price of admission to come out and hang out and really network with 109. And last time count when I talked to them yesterday early we're going to run just under 200 i'm sure they'll be over 200 as of today so we're excited to be there networking and have a good time with everybody but um like i said guys equity deals you're going to have to foreclose most of the time and if you look at it that way now if you can buy the note and get it reinstated and it makes sense roi wise on the cash flow great that's great but if you got to foreclose and you're only getting a little bit of return like why would you spend a year 
foreclosing if you're only going to see about a 5 to 10% return. That's not a good use of your monetary, <laughs> your monetary funds. That's not a good when you can do better and get a higher return for something that has no equity. The thing to keep in mind is when I buy notes, I like to make sure I control all the angles. All right, I want to be the, the person that actually is, can kind of control which way we go ultimately. Yes, and that means if I have to foreclose, I'm going to foreclose. What I also want to keep in mind, though, is if you, you're buying a note and the, there is no equity, the borrower is not going to fight you as much as, as we talked about before, but they're going to be more willing to work with you to try to stay, okay? Now, this is why it's important to look at what the rent rates are and true values of an asset so that you have some flexibility. Listen, I know you're upside down and there's no equity here. You owe 120, the house is worth 100. You know, those type of conversations put me in the power, the pole position, the power seat. And let me help you. Let's try to come to the arbitration, come to something that makes sense for you. Okay. Um, what isn't always an easy conversation is when you're coming across the opposite way where it's worth 120 and they owe 100. I mean, yes, we know with pay, you know, uh, payoffs and things like that, lap backups, they may not have much equity. But you still, though, it's something that the bar is going to keep in mind. I only owe this. I think I can go out and get a loan to get payoff. It's just going to drag out. Those loan modifications never usually work. Never. I'm not saying usually. I'm not saying that somebody hasn't gotten somebody will get modified and it made sense in that, in that kind of aspect. Of but with the rule of, I mean, the law of numbers out of 10 notes you buy, Half you're going to foreclose on, you know, a quarter of them you're going to get deed and lose, a quarter you get reperforming, depending on what you're buying. But if it's a non-performing note with equity, and I'm talking a sizable chunk of equity, expect the sellers going to sell it close to unpaid balance. In the case where it's they owe 50 cents on the dollar of value, let the sellers going to want closer to 45 cents. It's not worth taking the time to to foreclose. Yes, could you get a deed in lieu? Yes, but there's no guarantee to that unless you know something that we don't know. Unless, of course, the borrowers express that in their um, servicing files or things like that. And you also got to be careful. And th another thing on the side notes here, you also got to be careful what the seller's BPO says. Is it just a, a valuation? Is that ninety thousand dollar value that they're given true, or is it really seventy? Is that ninety grand based off a of Zillow estimate? <laughs> <laughs> good luck with that exactly Greg good luck with that so that's that's a couple of things to discuss uh, with you guys this morning on stuff um, I get bombarded with people hey do you want to do these deals do you want to do deals? And the first thing I look at is okay what's the payoff on this now if you take consider the true payoff then it gives you an opportunity to say there is no equity to this which is nice but uh, a lot of times that's not the case there's equity there's Somebody's going to fight you. And I don't want to fight people. I, those are, that's why when I get a tape in, I almost automatically kill those deals. I just go ahead and remove them. Boom, boom, boom. It's not worth it. It's not worth me fighting back and forth when I get a better deal when it's truly non-performing out there. So what questions, comments anybody have out there? Nobody's working on deals. Todd, zero questions. Wow. It's Thursday. People are like, it's I'm tired. Pre-Friday. It's pre. I got the pre-Friday, pre-hungover, the pre-over instead of the hungover. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff, everybody. So, um, one of the things too you'll run into is people that maybe they don't have the money to modify it, but those that have equity will often then either do one of a couple of things. They'll either file a TRO, a pre-foreclosure that's a temporary restraining order. That can delay things 90 days. All right. Now they usually have to show the judge good cause for that to get a temporary restraining order. Either the seller has been predatory or not done the things they're supposed to do. Uh, the, the other thing that often happens a lot is the seller files BK. All right. They file bankruptcy. Now the, the beautiful thing about bankruptcy is you then have somebody to talk to. All right. You've got an attorney to talk to. It does delay things quite uh, some. You're talking another three to six months. But there's a couple of things that are great about bankruptcy is while they're filing bankruptcy or working through the bankruptcy, they're supposed to be making payments. They're supposed to make their existing payment while they're working through the bankruptcy. Now, that doesn't always happen. So that can have an often help to work to have the bankruptcy discharged. 
the thing once somebody files bankruptcy and they come up with it, you know, a chapter 13 is a workout plan to supposedly get caught back up in five years. Those can be really nice modifications. Those can be really good, desirable notes. If somebody's in a BK chapter 13 and our buddy, Jack Krupe over there runs a hundred million plus fund that focuses primarily just on BK chapter 13. They want that cash flow. Okay. So one thing you got to keep in mind too, is how long is that payments coming in? And look, and what's beautiful about a bankruptcy deal, oh my gosh, it's literally like an x-ray machine. You can see underneath the clothes. You see the true colors, or you see the true behind the curtain. Borrower has to open their kimono. You've got the flasher there through the pacer.gov, the bankruptcy files. You can find so much information out. What do they have for assets? What are they making? What do they value the house at? And that's a nice thing too. You see what they value the house at. Now that helps dramatically because you have to look at this because if the seller of the note is valuing the house a lot more than what the, the owner of the house is, the borrower is, that works as a negotiating chip in your due diligence. So, well, yeah, you're valuing at 130, but the borrowing value is 120. And that's a bankruptcy filing. That's a lot more, <laughs> a lot more accurate thing unless you're going to share your VPO with me. Okay. Oh, it's an ABM, an automated valuation model. No, that's not, that's not accurate. A BPO, appraisal are two of the better things that you have to have. Okay. Yeah, Pacer.gov. And it's relatively cheap. You can download a whole BK file for just a few dollars and you get so much information like that. And actually one of the upcoming Monday notes we're going to have, we're going to have Daniel Singer on from the law office of Daniel Singer to go through a bankruptcy file. Actually, I just got an email from him that he's good to go this Monday night to go through breaking down bankruptcy files and looking at collateral files. So we're pretty stoked about that. We'll have the link up uh, and out later today so you can get registered to attend that free webinar, probably last hour, hour and a half with Daniel Singer and give you a lot of information on those two things. I know a lot of people out there don't really spend a lot of time on that because that's one thing that's better just to sink your teeth into and get your fingers dirty when you have it because it's so valuable to look at stuff. Now, like we had our fast track students with us last weekend and one of the highlights that they liked was looking at collateral files. Mm -hmm. That's different looking at a collateral file in your hand versus just an electronic file. Now you'll learn a lot of electronic filing, but you'll learn so much more looking at the hard collateral file you come in and you see the, the backgrounds and you see the 1003 application you see the notes in the files, you see pictures, you see sometimes if a borrower tried to do a loan mod or a short sale, a lot of times that stuff will end up in the collateral file. Sometimes it's just the loan file itself and the assignments. It's kind of a thin file, which is okay. But it's much more valuable when you do have the original 1003 application because then you see what's going on with the bar. You see where they've been at. But if they've ever filed bankruptcy, that's a good thing to check because you'll get a lot more information. You'll get phone numbers, you'll get work information, salary, and that helps you identify stuff that makes sense. It helps you identify opportunities there. Now, let me give you a little example of identifying an opportunity. If a borrower is making 50 grand a year in salary, what you want to do is an easy calculation is to take 38% or take 30, just take a third of 50 grand, which is 17,000 bucks roughly. 16.5, 16, 16.3, okay? It's actually 16.6. It's like 16 two thirds is a third of 50 grand. Well, homeowners, if you're getting qualified for a mortgage, you shouldn't be spending more than really 38% on your mortgage payments, your PITI stuff. So if somebody's got $1,700 a year, or not 1700 17, that'd be a really slow mortgage if it was only $1,700 a year, okay? Wow. That's cheap. You're living in a cardboard box out back, okay? Running from Mr. Uh, Bobby Bum, okay? So what you do <laughs> is take 17 grand and divide that by 12 months, okay? And that's gonna come out to approximately 1,300 bucks roughly, I think. Let's run a calculation. 17,000 divided by 12. 1,416 bucks. 1,416 and 67 cents. That's what their really combined PITI should be. So that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at modifying a note, modifying an asset, looking to see the affordability of what they're doing. Now, of course, they're, they're making 24 grand a year. 
That's not a lot of money. It means eight grand in total payments. That comes out to what? Eight grand divided by 12 is like 700 PITI. Well, that's not a lot of income. It's also not a lot of money. So you got to be careful of that. So one of the things that's, and most people don't understand that. They don't understand where that comes from. Being an ex-mortgage banker, that's one of the things that we look at. Hey, what are you making roughly individually and then, or combined to see if you can qualify for something that's going to make sense for stuff like that? So any questions, comments from anybody out there, Nicole? Uh, Donovan said it was a blast looking at those collateral. Donovan was here. Yeah, he really enjoyed it. He's like, what am I looking at? And he's flipping in. And Marlene was like, I don't understand this. And then I was like, well, look at, see what you have. Look at the story that the loan file tells you. Yeah, Donovan had a good time. We had, you know, everybody had a file folder to look at. We kind of, I spent some time going through it to say, oh, look here. We found the old 1003, the loan application. Oh, look, this is what they're working. And the person that we were uh, looking at, his loan file was having him making 24 grand a year as a loan processor, a loan servicer uh, employee. And you could see in a loan file that basically, A, his house was originally, he had 41, but he took a cash out refi at 90. About three years after he bought the property, this was in Tampa. So the loan was for 90. You can see he pulled cash out of the deal. That's always a valuable thing to see if it was a purchase or a cash refi. Because then my question is, if I'm talking to a borrower, is what you do with that cash? Did you spend it on toys? Did you pay for it to go to school? What did you do with the deal? Okay, what you do with the cash, and so that's always a valuable thing. We'll go through some of that stuff on Monday night, as well as Daniel going through a collateral file, discussing what what it is you're looking at. I mean, I have found collateral files with a deed and lose been already written in there, and that's if that's the case. Great, awesome. Let's list it as an REO. I've also found checks, insurance company checks, sitting in the file folder that the previous note holder missed or the note owner missed, made out to them. Just got to get it reendorsed and, and file the claim. So you see so much information in collateral files that can help you determine things. Take the time to look at that stuff. All right. Take the time to span through. And yes, if it's the first couple of files, it's going to be confusing. You may want to have somebody jump on it and look at it with you. Somebody who's a little more experienced. Hey, would you mind looking through the collateral file with me quickly? Now, I'm not going to do it. If you're buying 10 notes, I'm going to spend time doing it 10 times, but I will look at one or two with you. And it's always good if you take the time to look at that stuff yourself first, because you'll see some things. It'll help you identify what you're looking at and give you a much more accurate story of things. For good? Yeah. All right. Donovan asks, what if the property is really cute? Can we do it then? Oh, Donovan, Donovan, Donovan. If the property is really cute, it's so pretty. I like that. It's such a pretty house. OTSC. Oh, that's so cute. Avoid the OTSC syndrome, okay? And Donovan set me up for that with that softball. I have to pay him a buck for that. But <laughs> so many people are like, oh, that's so cute. Oh, that's so cute. That's usually my rhetoric. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this cute. Look at that. Now, don't be wrong. It's nice to buy cute assets, right? Mm -hmm. It's easier to market cute assets. Mm -hmm. if, if the numbers work. We should say, oh, look at that return. <laughs> oh, that return's so cute. Okay. That's the better way to look at it. Um, you just, yeah, you got to take the emotion out of it. And I think so many real estate entrepreneurs coming over, whether they're an REO re refugee coming to the note game, they're a fix and flop flunky who are looking for REOs. They have the idea of the whole equity thing. You have to assume a you're going to have to foreclose and be hopefully your first strategy should be to modify. Okay. Modify, modify, modify. Now in some cases, if it's deceased, like our good buddy, Adam ends up getting a lot of deceased. He's the, yeah, he's the note undertaker. Great. <laughs> Rest in peace. Our low returns. <laughs> October, didn't you do the uh, deals that we killed? Well, that was a different one, wasn't it? No, that was, that was for a fast track. The killer deals we killed. That's right. Last October, it was the election. Oh, we did, we that's did right. We did borrowers sucking you dry. Yes, and with Hillary, Hillary and Donald. And Donald was, was Frankenstein. Yeah, Donald was Frankenstein, the Trumpenstein, and Hillary yeah. was uh, Hillary with the Hillary. veins. Yeah, exactly. 
we're an equal opportunity to make fun of her here over here. Okay. Yes. First and foremost, we poke fun of ourselves first, but anyway, yeah, that's, uh, where were we going with that anyway? I don't, I don't, oh, spooky, spooky. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. That so that's anyway. a, now one thing too, keep in mind too, if it's a deceased borrower, you're going to have to foreclose. Then, like I said before, the overage, if it's a deceased borrower, that overage is going back to the estate or the other lien holders in the state, the other debtors versus coming back to you. All right. Now, I think we'll cover that for a later time. But in some cases, what's good to see is what's property selling at the foreclosure auction. Now, in some states, you can actually see what literally is going to foreclosure and the, the bids and things like that. Florida is really good about having their foreclosure auctions that you can check out online. And that helps out tre tremendously when we're looking at, when I'm looking at assets there, hey, what do I need to bid on? You know, we're getting ready to foreclose on something. Um, you know, let's look at what the comps are. I mean, we've used that several times in the past. Sold a six unit apartment complex in uh, Southwest Florida. I'm sorry, not South, uh, West Palm Beach actually. So it's not West, Southeast. And we were able to, you know, see what the, uh, similar properties what were they were foreclosing at, and it helped us, helped us come up with our initial bid at the foreclosure auction, which we got. We sold it. Boom, made 175 grand in eight months. That's not a bad return. No, not bad at all. So, anyway, but that's that's the thing. Keep in mind, guys. Look, I get it. Hey, equity's gonna protect my investment. It's not really protecting your investment because the fact is there's not a lot of money to be made on that aspect of the overage of, or not the overage, but the little bit of balance that a seller is going to have. Now, yes, if a seller is going to sell it to you at 50% of UPB, then it would make sense. But most of the time, you got to be very careful on your values. Definitely, definitely never trust a seller's value. Check it yourself, jump online, pay the 50 bucks for a realtor to drive by, pay the 99 bucks for wegolook.com to drive by and give you some photos. Now, I'm going to pull values for you, but they'll definitely give you plenty of photos. And then that's pretty easy to then say, hey, this is a pretty good condition. I can then compare it with the, the recent sold online. Any questions, comments from anybody out there? No? I'm trying to think if I've, I've bought any assets that, had, have, that have had equity. I mean, it's a sizable amount that we were able to take back. Rarely so. Rarely so have we been able to do that. Um, I hear more from the second lien side where they foreclose subject to the first. You know, and then they handle the eviction. And then they, they take the property back then that point and then sell it off. Um, that's happened a few times. I know some people have done successfully that way, but that's not a strategy for what we do with the first lien position notes. So uh, like I said before, be very careful. Uh, it's a little different story with the contract for deeds. Like I said, again, once again, if they've been there for four years or have more than 25% equity, there are states that will require you to foreclose instead of the eviction side and contract for deeds. So, uh, but that's what we've got for today. Okay, guys, equity deals. Got to be careful. Just got to check it out. Um, equity or no equity, always verify, always pull your values and focus on the three biggest things. Values, values, values. That's making sure you have a true value that will protect your investor security. Taxes, checking taxes. All right. Making sure a tax foreclosure hasn't wiped out your asset or wiped out your position. Make, making sure that the borrower's name on the mortgage matches up the borrower's name on the property. And thirdly, title. Checking O and E, checking title reports, things like that, using Pro Title USA um, and pulling an ONE report, an ownership and encumbrance report to see what liens are on the property. Now that's one thing definitely keep in mind too. If there is equity, you want to make sure that there's no other liens out there that are going to eat up that equity as well. Okay. Um, you, you gotta be careful because sometimes hey they're the junior lien holder after Taxes and then you often sometimes liens are in a third position that hey, they can get wiped out if there's no equity at a foreclosure auction. But if there is equity, hmm, guess who's going to have their hand out holding, holding their hand out? You need to pay me. Please pay me. Pay me my money. Pay me my money now. All right. So that's all we've got for the episode, everybody. Please make sure to go check out our back episodes. Make sure to leave a, a review if you're enjoying the show. Once again, if you're listening internationally, like 5% of our listeners are, love for you to leave a review. And we've got people in over 20 countries listening in online. Um, that really excites me. It really shows that note investing is a worldwide thing. And honestly, one of the things I'm working on getting is Spain. Actually, Spain 
um, is kind of a launching a platform for non-performing notes in Spain. So the rain in Spain doesn't always land on the planes. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Boom, boom, boom. I'll be here all week. Pay your bartenders, everybody. <laughs> Take care of your wait staff. And uh, we'll see you all at the top. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.